Today's adventure is going to be the 1992 Thunder Rift adventure, Quest for the Silver Sword. Written by a William W. Connors. Uh, Connors is also known for working for TSR, id Software, like the makers of Doom and Quake. And was one of the primary people involved in making the Ravenloft setting for what I would guess is 2nd edition. Now, the Quest for the Silver Sword is designed for 46 characters of 2nd or 3rd level. And it primarily revolves around the small town of Torlin. So, Torlin has a problem. It's, uh... It's been under perpetual winter for the past two years at least. It starts off, this module starts off with the players at a place called the Dragon's Den Inn, which is located three days travel by carriage. This carriage is provided to the players by a messenger who was sent out to the nearby localities to find adventurers by the Burgomaster Gustovin. For those that don't know, a Burgomaster is pretty much like a mayor, and Gustovin is pretty much the mayor of Torlin. Upon arriving at Torlin, your players will meet with the Burgomaster where he will tell the PCs about how his town has been under the curse of perpetual winter for two years, and he will advise the players that he has an idea of where the curse is originating from. He will advise the players that about three springs ago, a group of hunters had actually observed lights and other sort of strange happenings at a nearby ruined, sort of like keep, on the outskirts of town. This keep used to be inhabited by sort of like a crazy hermit wizard sort of person, so like a warlock or something. But he had died off and had been abandoned ever since. Now these hunters, when they saw the suspicious activity happening inside there, went in to investigate and noticed it was inhabited by a bunch of disgusting creatures. In which case, these hunters, being non-adventurers, retreated back to the town and advised the burgomaster of their findings. Now at this time, the town of Torlin was not under perpetual winter and was perfectly normal. The burgomaster sent out a call for adventurers and a group of adventurers that actually went up to the keep to try and deal with the issue. However, those adventurers never returned and shortly afterwards, the town came underneath perpetual winter. The Burgermaster believes that something happened inside the keep to those adventurers and it somehow led to this curse of never-ending winter to come upon his town. And he wants you guys, or the players, to solve the issue for him. And as for a reward, he doesn't have much to offer beyond, you know, whatever you can loot from the castle. So this is pretty much going to require the goodwill of the players uh, to go forward. Now, should the players accept this quest, uh, the hike to get to the ruined keep is only going to take about two hours. In which case, they'll come upon a dark and gloomy ruined castle that's only one level up on a hill. At this point, the module advises that you place the poster map of the actual keep on the table for your players to observe. However, if any of you are like me, you do not have the poster map, so you're just going to have to wing it, but I'm going to go ahead and display it on the screen for you. It's actually a very nice map. The players start off in the section labeled Start Here, and then right in that room is actually going to be like a cloak room that if the players go inside of it, it's pretty obvious it's a cloakroom it's where it's like a bunch of destroyed cloth items and fallen racks and what's left of cloaks, hence the name cloakroom. Once they go inside there, they'll actually disturb a series of giant rats. There's four at most. It's not that dangerous to counter. They should be able to deal with it. They're, they're level two at this point at least, so even level one could deal with four giant rats. As they go past that room, they'll end up going into the sitting room. The sitting room's furniture is actually in pretty good condition and functional. And the one thing that sticks out is actually going to be like a... There's a skull on like the center table and it's got like a candle inside of it. Now the players have can do three options with this skull. They can A, ignore it. B, they can try and break it, in which case it'll explode and do TD... 2d4s worth of damage to everybody in the room, and if they save versus breath, they can only just take 1d4. This could actually end up killing a character or two. Or three, they can light the candle inside of it, you know, if they're feeling a little bit uh, you know, frisky. And the ghost of Barak, who was the wizard of this castle at one time, 
will actually make his presence known, and he will advise the players that there is something evil in my castle, and then he will burst into flames and engulf the nearest magic user. And that magic user will actually go unconscious from, you know, catching on fire. Now, of course, the player characters should think that this is a horrible thing. Oh no, their magic user's dead. However, once they wake him, the magic user will find that he's actually at full health, and he's gained a point of intelligence. So he's one point smarter. The character is... I don't know about the player. Room 3 is uh, called the study, and it's a small room. There's a like table there with a pretty nice looking book on top of it that's opened. Uh, the pages are yellow with age and covered in dust. A uh, crimson bookmark lies on top of the page, indicating the book has been opened to a passage of some importance. So there should be a hint to the player characters. There's also a tarnished suit of plate armor standing in the corner. Now, this suit of plate armor is the single creature that's actually inside there. It's a it's pretty much an animated suit of armor, except in this edition it, it's called an armor golem. This armor golem actually has an armor class of 2, and it has 4 plus 1 hit die with 21 hit points. And it does 1d6 worth of damage every single time it hits. Uh, this armor is actually pretty useful if the player characters actually, you know, scavenge it. Uh, they can repair it and have it cleaned again uh, for about 500 gold pieces. And then after that is done, the armor will become a suit of plate mail plus one that will fit any human character. The book is actually full of a bunch of first level spells. These spells can be used like magical scrolls or they can be used to like expand any magic user's spell book or spells that he has access to, which would be useful. But however, if the player characters need the spells now, the spells inside the book can be used like spell scrolls. There's also some other smaller pieces of treasure. There's like a thousand silver coins, 250 gold pieces, a platinum necklace... Nothing really big is inside this room. The fourth room is the library. This library is full of books. However, they're all completely worthless because every book is ruined. However, if they're careful, they can find a small chest inside this room that has a crystal key inside of it. However, getting this key is not as easy as it sounds. If your players you know, try and use brute force to open up this chest, the key will actually break into shards. This key is actually useful for later on in the adventure. The next room is the dining room. Should the players decide to loot the silver inside the room, they'll find a small, like, dinner bell. This dinner bell will seem different from all the other stuff because it's not tarnished like all the other silverware. Should a player ring it, this bell will magically create... Any food that player character desires. This bell can do this three times a day. However, should the player characters ring this bell, they risk drawing the attention of the ratlings that live in the keep. When the bell is rung, the DM should roll a d6, and on a 6, 1d4 ratlings attack the character from any direction. These ratlings aren't really that dangerous. They're only one hit die creatures with a thaco of 19 and only do d4 damage. Shouldn't be that hard. Room 6 is one of the towers, and it's actually inhabited by a white widow spider. Uh, this spider is actually pretty creative. Uh, the web around it is not actually used to trap prey. Instead, it's designed to whistle in the wind. And when it whistles in the wind, it creates sort of like a harmonic melody that player characters need to make a save against, otherwise they'll be lulled into, like, lethargy. And then the Spider will attack. This is another one of the locations that should the player characters start making noise, there is a 1 in 6 chance that more ratlings will appear to try and fight them. Room 7 is the kitchen, which is actually inhabited by ratlings. They don't need to find you, they're actually in here. Uh, but beyond them being in there, there's not much treasure. There's 1 to 4 of them inside there. Room 8 is some sort of tomb. This tomb has four caskets inside of it. However, these caskets uh, contain the remains of Barrack's four apprentices. They still continue to try and protect the keep. Uh, three of them are just common zombies, but the fourth is a ghoul. 
If I was running this against my players, I would probably make it seem like the ghoul is pretending to be a zombie until it attacks and paralyzes them. Should the players try to inspect the coffins after they defeat these creatures, they will find that each one of the coffins is actually trapped. Room 9 is an antechamber, which has nothing inside of it. Room 10 is the larder, which is inhabited by as many giant centipedes as there are player characters in the party. Now, giant centipedes aren't dangerous. Uh, they only have two hit points. However, if one of the players is bitten by one of these giant centipedes, they must save versus poison. Otherwise, for the next 10 days, they'll be moving at half speed, and uh, all their attacks will be at minus 4. Room 11 is a wine cellar. This wine cellar is inhabited by ratlings, too, on, uh, you know, a 1 in 6. Other than that, there's not much in here. Room 12 is a ballroom. This ballroom used to be elegant, but now it's filled with garbage and debris. Two exquisite ch chandeliers still hang from the ceiling, but... Uh, the air is thick with a foul odor of rotting food. Despite the chill, insects buzz to and fro, bloated from their feast of filth. The floor is slick with slime, and rats scurry amid the piles of refuse. Now, there is a surprise in here. There is a gelatinous cube that actually inhabits this room. Now, once they clear out the cube, each character has a chance to find items inside the, the bar with how much trash is inside there. Each player character is supposed to roll a 1d100, and there is a 1 through 50 chance that the players will find something. Though 26 through 50 is just giant rats. Uh, 1 through 5 can be magical items. Room 13 is what used to be Barracks Chambers. Now, inside this room at this time is currently just a spitting beetle, but the monster were rat that was inside this uh, ruined keep has actually also taken it over so you can cause this as like a random encounter if you want to. However, inside this room is a small strong box. If the players still have the key from the library, they can open this up and inside the strong box are three magical items. A dagger plus one, a wand of magical detection, and a bag of holding, including a bunch of gold and magical gems. Or not magical gems, just gems that are worth a lot of money. However, if they don't have the key, there's no way to open up this strong box. Room 14 is a storage room. This storage room just contains a bunch of the items that Barrack used to use for spell research. Uh, the DM is encouraged to make uh, descriptions of items found there strange. One of the examples given is, inside the first box you search is four withered butterfly wings. And you should give no explanation beyond that. The stranger the contents, the better. Room 15 is where the big battle will happen at. Uh, the description of this chamber is uh, it's the laboratory. Uh, this chamber is once used as a laboratory for research into strange and mysterious matters. Two large workbenches are covered with shattered remnants of beakers, burners, and other scientific apparatus. Most of the pieces are solidly frozen to the table's surface, and icicles dangle from the equipment along the edges of the counters. A shimmering layer of smooth ice covers the floor, making footing slippery at best. A large throne rests atop a pedestal in one corner of the room. Both throne and pedestal seem to have been carved from a single block of ice and radiate an aura of cold that affects everything in the room. Set within the ice is the slender shape of a silver sword. A lanky humanoid figure with the fur and face of a rat reclines on the throne. He holds a crude scepter fashioned from several bones. A crown of similar manufacture sits on his head. When his beady black eyes look upon you, a feeling of revulsion wells up within you and your comrades. The book gives two options here. The player characters can either A, attack the were-rat immediately from the beginning, or B, they can talk to the were-rat. However, they come to the same conclusion anyways. Uh, the were-rat ends up fighting against the player characters along with 1d4 uh, ratlings showing up to back him up. Now, once they defeat the were-rat and his minions... They'll observe that the silver sword inside the throne is still there. Uh, players can attempt to try and burn it out, or they can try and chip it out, but no matter what they do, they're not supposed to be able to get to the sword. There's only one person that can get to the sword, and he's in the next section. But before I get to that section, I should probably also point out the fact that the book says that if any character gets knocked down to half health because of the were-rat's, like, 
teeth biting, uh, there's a pretty decent chance he's going to turn into a were-rat soon, unless he deals with a high-level cleric. The next room is some sort of, like, prison cell. Inside this cell, they will find the frozen corpses of a bunch of elves. Now, they're not actually dead, though. If the player characters actually thaw these individuals out, they will actually still be alive. And one of them will advise the players that the sword stuck inside the throne is actually his and has been in his family for hundreds of years and only he can command it. Now, getting him to go into the throne room slash laboratory, he'll be able to take control of the sword and the throne will melt. This is not the end of the adventure, however, because once the throne melts, part of it actually forms into an ice golem that the player characters then have to fight. Uh, this ice golem is like a three-hit die monster. It's not really too bad, but seeing as how everything else the player characters have gone through, this may kill a few of them. Now, once they defeat this creature... This is the end of the adventure. The player characters return to Torlin. The Burgomaster will provide them each with a home inside of Torlin that they can use at any time they want to, no matter what happens to them in the future. They'll be provided with whatever food and drink they desire inside the, vill the town, as long as, you know, they can actually provide it, because they're still... It's still a pretty crappy town right now. Should the characters have saved the elves instead of... Oh... Killing them like a bunch of murder hobos to get a hold of a magical ice sword. There's no way that happened in the game that I ran. Should they have saved them, the elves also reward them with a treasure amount that is up to the DM to decide. Though it does say in the book it should be influenced on how cordial the adventurers were with them. And with that ends the quest for the silver sword. Uh, they aren't supposed to actually end up with the silver sword. Uh, they don't... They don't actually end up with very much at all, actually. They get like a, a magical bell that gives them food, a few hundred gold pieces, and uh, one point of intelligence to a smart magic user. There's not much here. But, I mean, it's a, it's a good way to expand the player character's contacts, I guess, because if they save the, the elves, they'll have a contact with the elves that'll actually be able to work with them in the future. Uh, the village of Torlin will actually be extremely grateful for them. And they'll be well on their way to building a name for themselves. For rating-wise, I would actually rate the adventure uh, 3 out of 5. It's, it's middling. Everything's about average here. I mean, there's nothing great about it. There's also nothing extremely horrible about it. It's literally just one building. For value, I'm actually going to rate this a 3 out of 5. Now, as of now, you can only buy the PDF from the DM's Guild for 5 bucks. Which isn't too bad. But the, the reason why I'm rating it 3 out of 5 is because you can still currently get physical copies off of eBay for between $30 to $50 right now. Now, there's no print-on-demand version of this yet. For deadliness factor, this is also going to rate a, a 3 out of 5. This entire adventure is pretty much middling. I don't find it to be a bad adventure. It's just something you'd stick in the middle of uh, any like campaign you're running. Well, I hope this helps somebody out there, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.